Thank you, Laird, for leading us to anointed music. Thank you, choir. Wasn't it great worship tonight? God bless you. You may be seated. <clears throat> glad to have all of our guests. Um, all of you that Pastor Terry named, I'm glad you came. I love my mother. I thank God for her. One of the more profound statements, I would not have been here without her. And I'm glad to have Jeff and Michael home, and I'm glad they're here. And Gentry has found the love of his life, and we love Lexi, and we're glad that you're here. I give honor to Pastor Terry and Melanie and Kendra and Braden and the Shocks and to this great church. One of the most famous, majestic mountains in the world is the Matterhorn. Uh, it's the monarch of, of the Alps. Uh, 14,780 feet in height. It's on a border between Switzerland and Italy. The Matterhorn is not the highest. It's not as high as other peaks in that vicinity. But there is a singular beauty about it. It's kind of its individuality which sets it apart. But when the morning sun rises and its golden rays shine upon its summit, and when the rays of the sunset paint it crimson, the beauty of the Matterhorn is indescribable. If I were, after hearing my superintendent preach, if I were to say what the Matterhorn scripture is in the Word of God, it may not be the tallest that you may think it is. It may not be exactly where you would think I would be going. But to me, the Matterhorn of the Word of God is the great commission of Jesus Christ. It goes back to the book of beginnings. It's the first book of the Bible. It's Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It says that I will put enmity between the thee and the woman, the seed and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, but thou shalt bruise his heel. It goes beyond Genesis. It goes on back to the foundation of the world. How far back, I do not know, but I know it's far enough back that he said it was before Genesis 0 and 0. He said, I was the lamb slain. For sinners. In the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, the consummation of all things, the end towards which all of history is swiftly moving, the Lamb is mentioned 28 times. The Lamb for sinners slain before the foundation of the world. Therefore, we must rightly conclude as apostolic people that the Great Commission the heavenly mandate of Almighty God of the universe, the earthly assignment to which he has given us, the Matterhorn of the Holy Scripture is the Great Commission. From Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible is the story of Almighty God of the universe going after lost people. His image is stamped on every one of us and them. Almighty God was just not playing with mud and accidentally made a man. But he made him from the earth. Then he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. And man became a living soul that will spend eternity in one of two places. Either heaven or hell. I know we put a lock on hell. I know it's not real convenient to mention in, in 2016 because we're dealing with so many people that's living and this is not a cuss word but hell on earth. But may I tell you there's still a place called hell. 
And Jesus preached about it three times more than he did about heaven. That's what he thought about a suffering Calvary. And that's why he said, I will do all of Calvary for one lost soul. Because there is a lake of fire. And in his unique sense of values, he compared the unequal greatness of one man and one soul. He said it's worth more than the whole world. That's why he is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance and everlasting life. He made it very clear, all souls are mine, and I have none to lose. Therefore, the Great Commission is not debatable. It is the thing of the most vital importance. It is to be sounded forth to the whole world, to the uttermost, and to every creature. It is time for the apostolic church to propagate the gospel. It will be done or it will never be done. For he gave us five times in the New Testament. It's not just one time. It's not just one chapter. But he commands and gives mandates and he commissions that the essence of all five of these commandments is go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and he that believeth not shall be damned. It's amazing that on the first day of his resurrection, he said to his disciple, As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. The great heavenly mandate in our earthly assignment is undebatable. He will remind us again at the judgment seat of Christ where Paul reminds us that knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Luke was not an apostle. Luke was a physician. We know Luke is the book by, called by his name, but he also is the author and the writer of the book of Acts. And when you look at how both Luke ends and how the book of Acts begins, you will read that the last words of Jesus Christ just before his ascension they have to be some of the most important words if the last words he spoke, he gave. He clearly revealed a lost world was on his mind. So a lost world was on his mind when he came, and a lost world was on his mind when he left. He wanted that so engraved and stamped in our hearts that he lingered 40 days longer after his resurrection to make sure that his apostles understood his message. But not only his message, but they understood his mission. And just before he ascended and a cloud received him out of sight, he said, ye shall receive power from on high. He said, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you to do something for me. It's not just your passport to heaven. He said, the Holy Ghost will come upon you to do something for me. He said, you shall be my witnesses. He said, it'll go everywhere. Samaria, Judea, Judea, the utmost parts of the world. That is global mission. That's North American missions. It covered the entire book of Acts and it's plain to see that the Holy Ghost is a missionary spirit. In a 10-day prayer meeting, it happened. Suddenly, they received this Holy Ghost that came from heaven, and they knew where the power for witnessing came from, and also the miracles, the signs, and the supernatural wonders. They continued to pray in the temple and everywhere because they knew that prayer was the key. It was in a prayer meeting that the Holy Ghost fell that gave them the power to witness. So that's why in some form or fashion in just about every page of the book of Acts, you will find some form of prayer. Prayer and intercession are tied into one, the very why of our existence. No prayer, no power. Little prayer, little power. Our churches need to turn back into a house of prayer. He said, first of all, prayer. He said, the gospel message, it has to be witnessed, and then it's got to have the power and the demonstration. 
Almighty God has set aside an entire dispensation for evangelism. This business of winning people, of moving people from sin to salvation, from Satan to God, from hell to heaven. That's the reason for the incarnation of God becoming flesh. Of Almighty God in human form, the eternal spirit wrapped in skin, living out, fleshing out the Great Commission. May I tell you, Jesus is not from this world. Jesus was not from Israel nor America. Jesus was from another world in a place called heaven. And he came to the world as a missionary because he wanted us to understand that we are missionaries that are called to propagate his gospel around the world. Seeking and saving the lost is what you have been called to do. The mighty God in Christ, which our superintendent preached about, is not a doctrine just to be argued. It is a revelation of eternal purpose. So you want to call us one God people? Okay, let's go. Let's take a journey beside just explaining why we believe that God was manifest in the flesh. Let's take a journey into this scripture. Let, let, let's get real oneness here, okay? To with it, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he hath committed unto us the words of reconciliation. He said, I will you to understand that I came so that they might live. And you have to understand that I have chosen you to reconcile the world unto me. Every creature deserves that opportunity. And three or four years ago, when I gave the keynote in this pulpit, I quoted Oswald J. Smith. And I will say it again. No one deserves to hear the gospel twice until everybody has at least heard it once. That's the reason for three and one half years, his powerful sermons. How about the Sermon of the Mount? How about taking Nicodemus out and saying, you must be born again? How about him putting his reputation on the line? I sure don't advise this for any of us. I'm not going to do it. I think I'll take Mickey with me. But how about him going to a well where there was a Samaritan, a half-breed lady, and then telling his disciples to leave to a woman that had five husbands and one she was with, wasn't her own. And yet he sat there and propagated the gospel to her. He did not come so much to preach as he did to come give us a message to preach. He spent most of the night with God in prayer, and he spent his days seeking and saving the lost. Read the gospel. Hear him calling. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Because Jesus knew disciples are not born, they are made. It was the staff by day, it was his pillow by night. It's the mind of Christ. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's the Matterhorn of the Holy Scriptures. His parables reveal the reason why he came. And I know it's quieter tonight, and you know what? I want it to be quiet. Man, this speaks into my life. Three minutes before I walked out, he said, God is with you, and, and you're going to proclaim the message, but don't speak off a response tonight. I had planned that before I ever got here because I've heard from the Lord, and if I don't get it out, it's my fault, not his. He taught us about one lost sheep. He said, you leave the 90 and 9, and you go look for that one lost sheep. And did he not tell us in Matthew 12 and 12? He said, how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it not lawful to do so on the Sabbath day? He said, I'll break any rule you have to go reach one lost soul. I'll do whatever I have to do to go reach one lost soul. There's not a man more valuable than a sheep. He said, there's a lost coin. He said, it's still a coin. He said, it may not be in circulation, but it's still a coin. He said, for those that may not walk among you, or for those that may have made ministry mistakes, for, for those that may no longer be in circulation, 
He said, would you get your broom out? And would you go looking for the coin that's no longer in circulation? Then he took us to that dad. He took that dad. And he said, he's looking for that boy to come home. Everybody said the dad didn't leave house. He made the boy come home. That's not true. Bible says he looked down the road. And when he saw him coming home, he left and ran to meet him. Because that was the Spirit of the Lord. And when you look at that great triology of parables of Jesus Christ, and you see those three uh, parables that are laid out there of the Matterhorn of Scriptures, you would say, that's all we need. One lost sheep, one lost coin, one lost son. That's all we need. But that's not what Jesus did. I want to stand to you, he said, how important the Matterhorn of the gospel is. So he said, I'll give you the parable of the talents. And if that's not good enough for you, I'll give you the parable of the pounds. And if that's not good enough for you, I'll give you five wise and five foolish. And if that's not good enough for you, I will give you the entire chapter of Matthew 25. That is a heaven and hell issue that if you do not love my poor and feed them, I will say, depart, I know you not. I will give you an entire chapter to let you know how much. And if that's not enough, then I will take you to Matthew 13 and I will lay on you some more parables. And if that's not good enough, then I'll give you a story about a good Samaritan that walked past a fella and picked him up. And if that's not good enough, then I will give you some figures of speech. You are salt, you are light, you are water, and you are bread. He said, because I want you to know the reason why I came. It's not about you, it's about them. It's not about your church, it's not about your people. It's about lost people that don't know Jesus Christ. That's why I came. That's the reason for Calvary. That's the reason for the resurrection. That's the reason for ascension. That's the reason for Pentecost. That's the reason for heaven and hell. That's what the Bible is all about. That's what the church is all about. That's what his daily agenda and abbreviated life ministry was all about. It is our heavenly mandate and it is our earthly assignment to take presidents over everything and every other agency in our church. It should be kept aflame in every church. Reaching the lost has to be in every believer's life. We've got to have the same passion as the apostolic church had for lost people. He said, a bruised reed shall I not break. He said, if you even know something that can't write anymore, I won't break it. He said, I'll restore smoking flax, I shall not quench. He said, I'll blow in it, I can relight any fire, I can relight any flame. It is the great commission. And if that's not good enough, he said, I have another one. When you look at the book of Luke, he said, I looked at a group of people that I invited to come eat with me, and they made me a bunch of excuses. And the servant was told, he said, you go out quickly into the streets and the and the lanes of the city, and you bring hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the Lord told them, you go in the highways and the hedges, and you compel them. One translation says you bribe them to come. Whatever you got to do to fill my house, you get out of your house, and you go wherever they are to reach a lost soul. It is time that the church realizes we are here to propagate the gospel and the highest mountain in our lives should be the Great Commission. May I say to you humbly tonight, the Great Commission is not the byproduct, it is the product. It's not a department in the church, it is the church. It's not a preliminary bout, it's the main event. It's not a side show, it's the feature attraction. And we have prayed. Vani, our great prayer coordinator, gave us a prayer sheet that we prayed for revelation. I have heard it mentioned last night, we're praying for revelation in this conference. We pray for people to have revelation of the doctrines we believe. Tonight, I am going to tell you something. Take that word for one minute out of your mind. You need no revelation to what I am preaching tonight. 
If you're here thinking you need some revelation, let me tell you for the next minute, because you're going to get revelation in the next few days. But let me tell you this minute, you don't need revelation. What you need this minute is obedience. He went on a 40-day fast. He launched his ministry. He preached his very first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth. He announced what he had come to do, and in a nutshell, it was the Great Commission, the Great Commandment. He begins by reading Luke 4, 18, and it, you know when we say he quotes Isaiah, and he's, a, he's quoting a portion of Isaiah, but I'm getting ready to draw a distinction. In Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Here's what I've come to do. Because of this purpose, he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Don't forget the poor, people. He has sent me to heal up the brokenhearted. That's painful sometimes. He's come to settle me to preach the deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. And then he said to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book. And he takes it and he hands it to the preacher. And the Bible says that he sits down. He had enough confidence in the apostles. And he had enough confidence in what this man preached tonight. That in 2016, he could hand the book to 3,000 registrants in a little old town in Alexandria. And know that they would carry forth his commission. But when I said he didn't quote Isaiah, because as soon as he got through with this was the day of the Lord, Isaiah says this, and the day of the vengeance of our God. He didn't say that. He didn't say the vengeance of our God. He said, here's the book. There's going to be no vengeance of God because in 2016, I will have a group of ministers and wives that I have handed the book off to. The day of vengeance is coming, and it's about here. Revelation and the seals and the trumpets and the vials are getting close. But until then, I have given my book to a group of preachers, and I have given my book, and I've handed it off, that they will convey my message, and they will do what I have called them to do. There is no vengeance. So the book, the book is in my hand. The book is in your hand. He has sat down. You, sweet brothers and sisters, you stand between a sinner and the vengeance of God. You're the only thing left is the church of the living God. You're the only hope that this world has is the church of the living God. So something's got to happen to us. Something new's got to happen to us. Isaiah, who has 66 chapters, I guess you could call it a small Bible. It's a 66 books in the Bible. The 53rd chapter, most theologians, a lot of theologians believe that's the center of the Bible. Isn't it amazing that if the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah is the center of the Bible, isn't it amazing that the cross is at the center of the Bible? Because it's the heartbeat, it's the holy of holies, it's the eternal purpose of God from the foundation of the world. It's the consummation of all ages. Isaiah had quite a telescopic prophetic lens that he looked through the world. And I won't be on this long. I ministered last night to the general board and our speakers that were there. He saw things. Isaiah saw things. He's the most unbelievable prophet. Uh, when I should say believable prophet. But the most one that saw so many things that... It's hard to comprehend what all he saw. He saw the death of Christ. He saw graphic detail from beginning to end. He saw the burial of Jesus in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. He saw a conversion of a thief. He saw the resurrection of Jesus. He saw the prosperity of the cross. He saw that Jesus would be accompanied by two thieves. He heard Jesus pray for a guilty people in 
and make intercession for transgression. He saw that it all led to the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And then Isaiah records for us some of the greatest texts and sermons and sermons started that there's ever been. Uh, chapter 7, the virgin birth. 9 and 6, unto us a child is born. Name, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. He gives us Isaiah 53, the same God, the everlasting Father. He gives us Isaiah 44, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God I know. He gave us the reformation when he said precept upon precept and line upon line. Here a little and there a little. He saw the outpouring of the day of Pentecost in 2016. For he said with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. To whom he said this is the rest wherein the weary shall rest. His powerful sermons were along the line like Isaiah 12 and 3. He said you can draw waters out of the wells of salvation. He gave us the disguise of God. God's love in Isaiah 30. He talked about a broken reed and a smoking flax, and Jesus preached about it in Matthew chapter 12. Many, many sermons of revelation that I will not touch on tonight, but Isaiah saw it, and Isaiah heard it, and Isaiah preached it, and Isaiah sealed it, and then what historian says is they put him in an empty log, and they sawed him in two, and Isaiah became part of the Hall of Fame chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37. How could a man with such views see the cross. How can a man with such views see where a man's going to be buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb? How can a man see such things? Here's how. It started in the year that King Uzziah died. His crutch was knocked out from under him. He said, I looked up and I saw the Lord. And I saw him high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. He said, I saw all of eternity. He said, I, I saw the immortality. I, I caught a glimpse of the invisible world. I saw service and I saw holiness because I saw seraphims that were holy angels. And I saw them as they began to fly. And all of a sudden it was so holy that even the angels could not handle it. So with twain they did cover their face. And with twain they did cover their feet. And they cried, holy, holy, holy. And he said, then all of a sudden I felt the foundations of the temple begin to shake because I had been in the presence of a holy God and what I saw in another world when I saw God's holiness and his majesty and his angels covered their faces in pure unceasing worship then the demonstration of the supernatural began to happen he said it shot me into a sense that I was not my own I saw myself and when I saw myself I cried out, cursed is me. Or I cried out, woe is me. Now it's not, woe is the Supreme Court. Now it's not, woe is a political party. Now it's not, woe is the president. Now it's not, woe is the things we're going through around the world. But all of a sudden it is, woe is me. And that prophet that eclipses all other prophets, all of a sudden, it was he began to make a confession. Yes, God, I am a man of unclean lips. And when he did, Isaiah's confession, one of those burning, fiery angels grabbed the coal from off of the fire, the altar. Anybody that's got any fire, it's going to always come from the altar. And he came. And he touched his lips. And when he touched his lips, he said, Lord, you send me. I will fulfill the great commission. I will do what you call me to do. And the rest of history, you trace it all back to a hot coal. We didn't get Isaiah 7. We didn't get stammering lips. We didn't get reformation. We didn't get one God. We didn't get anything until he looked up and saw God's holiness. And he went to another level in his walk. And the fire of heaven touched his lips. And it changed him completely. Completely, because when you touch God, you touch fire. And when you touch fire, it changes your lips and it changes your anointing and you become fire. 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 Now, there's been some, I'm Raymond's pastor, Woodward. There's been other, I pastor you and I thank God for it. Brother Klein then spoke a word to me. Others have said, you've got to start seeing yourself as an elder among us. Well, that's hard for me to do. Now, I know I turned 66 last Tuesday. 
But it's hard for me to understand. And they always include Mike. And, and they always include you, Brother Huntley. And they said, y'all are now the elders. Right. Not anybody that, that was high in leadership. Not many left. Like Brother, I mean, we're the elders. So tonight, your elder is going to speak to you. Dr. Carl F.H. Henry, the noted theologian and author who wrote many books. One of his highlights was, The Gods of This Age or The God of the Ages. He gave warning in one of his powerful speeches to the American Baptist Convention. He said that many present-day churches may become spiritual ghost towns in another decade unless a wave of evangelical renewal sweeps over the Protestant Christianity. Let me read to you two days after A.W. Tozar. We preach a lot of his stuff. We read after him. Let me tell you what Alliance Magazine wrote two days after Tozar died. It published his convicting, penetrating article entitled, The Waning Authority of Christ in the Churches. He said, Jesus Christ today almost has no authority at all among the groups that themselves that call themselves by his name. And then he blamed the situation on two causes. He said, it's the influence of tradition and custom. And may I say, I don't mean doctrine nor our separation issues, but I'm talking about church as usual. He said, we have become so tradition and custom in our three songs, our prayer service and offering and the preacher preach that we don't have a move of God like we should really have in our congregations. And this man's already clarified it for me because he told you that BOTT and POA is the biggest sponsor of, of Urshan Bible College. He just told you that it wouldn't have made it without BOTT. What a compliment. I'm a very strong believer in that. And I want all of you young people to listen to me. You need to get your education. You need to go to our Bible College. You need to go to the universities. You need to go to Urshan College. If you can't go there, get it online. I am for education. But Tozar said the revival of intellectualism among among the evangelicals will kill us if we depend on intellectualism. This thing can't be done with the intellect. It's got to be done in the demonstration and the power of Almighty God. John the Baptist, I indeed baptize you with fire. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost in fire. Let me tell those of you that don't believe in the Spirit of God in the United Pentecostal Church, you have lost the battle. We do believe in apostles. We do believe in the prophets. We do believe in the five-fold ministry of the church. We believe in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. We fought for where I am. I was here. I'd been here since seven months. We celebrated 65 years of the man had been in Alexandria. I have been here since I was seven months old. I know the spirit of the 57s and the 58s and the 59s. Some of the greatest men of God that you'll ever want to see. That without them, we would not have the foundation under this organization that we have. And you let me be very clear about it. They're some of the greatest men of God that there's ever been. But they went through the oil dripping off of fingers and filling tooths. And there's living in our day and time, blowing on people and them falling over. But just because there's misuse doesn't mean there's use. We can't back away just because somebody may be misusing the gifts. We need the gifts of the Spirit to operate in our churches. It's time for us to have tons of interpretation and prophecy operating in our services. Let me see. This great man of God. Can any good thing come out of Canada? <laughs> if you don't know this man, let me introduce you to one of the greatest men there's ever been. This is Brother Benny DeMerchant. He's been in Brazil for 50 years. 
as a missionary. He's the longest lasting missionary in the history of the United Pentecostal Church. You may be seated. He said when he got there, I was so honored that his family asked me to preach the Saturday night of his wedding anniversary and 50 years of being in Brazil. He said, I want to do something I don't do for many of the Americans that come down. He said, but you're a pilot and you'll enjoy it. He said, we're going to fly all the way back to an Indian tribe. He said, it's about two and a half hours back. He said, we just got clothes on them. They were a naked tribe for years. He said, uh, that's pretty good holding the standard to preach right there, wasn't it? <laughs> That's an easy one to preach there, right? That's pretty undebatable among us there, right? So we got up in that plane. He said, you fly. He knew I was a pilot. I hadn't flown in, in 20 years. And, and then we were on a float plane. I said, Brother, Brother DeMerchant, I've, I've never flown a float plane. He said, well, you'll be okay. And so we get in. He, <laughs> he starts rocking. Then he starts talking to me. He said, you're... Your daddy was my hero. He said, he said we, we pattered a lot after him. He said, he and I operate a lot. He said, you know, he said, we went down there just hoping that we would have a thousand and that one day me and my wife could have a thousand. So he kept talking. He said, you know, one time I flew back to this tribe and I want to tell you something, folks. This man's something else. Um, uh, he has to put gas in his plane. He, they got an unbelievable campground. They park their truck up on a hill and they have 10, 10 gallons of gas. And you stand right here just a minute, okay? And you have to take all that gas down. So I get one in my hand, and, and I get one in this hand, and I start walking. And I go about 10, 15 yards, and I stop and rest. Here's old man, the merchant, out of respect. <laughs> Both of those gallons in his hand, just walking, and he keeps going. And we get there, the ladder, I said, Brother the merchant, I know where the tanks are. I said, let me do that. He said, move out of my way, son, I'll, I'll take care of that. I mean, this wasn't 50 years ago. This was two or three months ago. And he gets that gas tank, and he starts pouring the gas. Give me another one. We get pouring another one. We fill up that tank and fill up that tank. And then we start flying. I said, well, where, where are the VORs? He said, there are none. Uh, he said, we're going to be flying over the jungle. And, I, and then he pulled out three um, GPSs. He said, we'll follow this one to that river. And I said, well, what if we don't make it to the river? He said, well, well, this is no place to land. We'll just crash, but God will help us. So thank you, Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, God. So we flew from river to river. And so we get to where we're going, and, and he, 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 he lands that plane. I, he, he lets me think I'm landing it, but he's, he's over there on the other side with it. And, and we land that plane, we get out, and those Indians run to him. And, you could see their face glow and his face was a glow and that's something he's worked on for years. Then we get in the plane after greeting them and loving them and him taking all kind of that plane was loaded how we got off of the water. Thank God it was a long river. <laughs> he wanted 1,000 people when he and Sister De Merchant went there. They now have 1,800 churches and 140,000 members. <laughs> You may be seated. You may be seated. Why did, why did POA pay to get him here? Why did I want him here? Because in that flight, he told me the story. He said, we were fighting for the gifts of the Spirit. He said, and I was doing deputation 51 years ago. He said, and I was preaching for Brother Branding in St. Louis, Missouri. He said, and the money wasn't breaking loose. He said, and all of a sudden, Brother Branding walked up behind me. He said, thus saith the Lord. He said, you're going to Brazil, and God is going to take care of you. And you're going to build a church. But he said, now I must tell you something you may not want to hear. It's going to cost you a lot of pain. So he told me, he said, Brother Mangan, I've done it. He said, one time I took off and our engine quit, and we crashed. And I lost our missionary. She drowned. And I lost one of our pastors. He said, then, Brother Magan, he said, my son, my son, Benny Joe, that I love. He 
said they found out he had bone cancer. He said, we knew God was going to heal him. He said, but God didn't heal him. And it affected Sister DeMerchant. Where is she? Raise your hand, Sister DeMerchant. It affected her so bad that she's staying home and she couldn't get out and go. And all of a sudden, one day, she said, why am I sitting here? And God laid on her heart to start a Bible school. And they started a Bible school. Out of the pain of losing a son. And how many people have come through that Bible school? Guesstimate. 12,000 people have come through that Bible. When I preached, there was 10, 12,000 people. And there were hundreds of ministers that flowed down the aisle giving honor to him for his 50th year of missionary and he went there with the gifts of the spirit operating he unctioned he said we believe in the power we lay hands on the sick we've seen people raised from the dead we've seen blind eyes open we have a demonstration of the holy ghost thank you my friend we honor you we give honor to you, great man of God. Sister the merchant, we give you one big shout from the POA. You may be seated. Let me tell you about the man I lived with. Dad came here in 1950. Dad was something else in the organization. And there were so many peers that were so powerful. Uh, Terry's up here somewhere. His daddy loved my daddy so much, and my daddy loved Brother Pugh. Jared grabbed me at the funeral last week and told me about Brother Pugh. He said, uh, Brother Mangan was laughed at, he said, but it, Brother Mangan was admired, he said. He said, uh, I'd go and I'd say, Brother Mangan, how many got the Holy Ghost? He'd say 20, and, and he'd say, how many got the Holy Ghost? Well, you were, he said, I'd say two. He said, so I decided that I was going to find out what Brother Mangan did. So I went to him. This is Brother Pugh telling his son and grandson. He said, how long do you pray a day? And Dad said, oh, three or four hours a day. So Brother Pugh said, I started praying five. He said, how many days do you fast? He said, oh, I fast three or four days a week. He said, so I started fasting four or five days a week. He said, how long do you study the Word of God? He said, oh, I study the Word of God two or three hours a day. He said, so I started studying the Word of God for four or five hours a day. Then we came back together one of the first times I met him. He said, Brother Mangan, how many of you had the Holy Ghost? He said, I've been in Pensacola, Florida with Brother Welch, and we had a hundred soul revival. And he said, Brother Pugh, how many did you have? He said, ten. <laughs> he said, so I tried to figure out what did Jerry Mangan do that I didn't do? He said, I finally found out. I could not believe him. He believed God for anything. He believed that God could do anything. He believed that God would do anything. He believed that God could take care of anything. You may be seated. So Brother Pugh told me the story. And he said, let me tell you something about your dad. He said, I learned something from him. He said, when I was in the pulpit quoting poetry, your daddy had his handkerchief and was waving the aisles and laying hands on people. He said, your daddy put something in me. And I was able to tell Jared, yes, and Brother Pew put something in my dad. Because after daddy got everybody shouting and glory and hopping and hooting and holler, Brother Pew would take that preacher aside and mentor him. And he was one of the greatest mentors of people. And those two men, along with other men, built an apostolic church. But I watched Dad here. I watched Dad be made fun of. you got to understand Dad. Dad was the most misunderstood man in the United Pentecostal Church. Dad would get up and preach, and he was so hungry for revival. And he'd look at those sitting on him. Of course, we were in a battle. I mean, it was the 60s. And so finally, Dad would just look at him and say, You don't know how revival? Come by Alexandria. I'll show you. That wasn't a real good thing to say, Dad. But what it was, was their faces were aglow. 
This man, they were great works were established. They were self-sacrificing. They were self-denying. They were filled with God's love and compassion. These men were baptized with the heavenly flame from fire. Fire was in their praying. Fire was in their preaching. And fire was in their church services. And if we're going to have an apostolic church, we got to get the fire back in our singing. We got to get the fire back in our preaching. We got to get the fire back in our life. Maybe seated. So I decided it's going to happen to me. Last night at my house with these great speakers in the general board and our sponsors, when we got through last night with prayer and communion, there was tongues of interpretation. Ron Becton gave the tongue, and Superintendent of Michigan, Brother Trammell, gave the interpretation. And I will give it to you, and I know it's of God because I have a rest of the story. He said mantles when God began to speak. Of just men made perfect. He said they're going to be ancient mantles. They're going to fall in this conference. He said there's going to be men and women in this conference that are going to receive mantles that are ancient mantles and that are mantles of their forefathers that are God is going to drop upon them and they're going to feel anointing resting upon them. So at 6.20, my pastoral team came and met me. And they're praying over me. And they're all close to me. And Jason Robbins is praying. Where's Jason? He's probably in the overflow room. But Jason was praying over me. And when we get through praying, he stopped. And he says this. He said, the Lord just spoke to me. And he said, when you're preaching tonight, there's going to be ancient mantles that are going to fall from heaven. And men are going to be touched with mantles from another world. It's going to happen in a very... Sp- I said, were you there last night? Were you outside parking cars? I don't even know what you're talking about. I said, has anybody talked to you from last night's service? He said, no, I hadn't talked to anybody. He said, while we were praying, God just spoke that to me. You let me tell you something. There's going to be something happening in this meeting. You've been praying for a fresh anointing. You've been praying for the fire of God. There's going to be a mantle, an ancient mantle of God. You may be seated. You may be seated. You may be seated. Just trust me right now. I know it was ready to break right there. Just trust me right now. But it doesn't come easy. And Mark, this is where you're supposed to know about. This year, God visited me. At the end of the year, I knew that personally I was going to have to go to another level in ministry here at POA. I knew that I had to have a fresh touch at BOTT. So I started studying men that had revival and repentance. And I found 1 Chronicles 21 and 2 Samuel 24 where David had numbered the people. His greatest sin wasn't an anointing. More people died because he numbered the people, 70,000 men. But he makes his way to Ord and he's threshing for. <laughs> and he repented. He said, God, it's not the people. He said, it's me. It's me, Lord, that's repenting. And he repents there at that spot. And the Bible says that he talks to God of repentance and the angels sheath their sword and the, the dying stops and the fire of God falls from heaven. Then when the fire falls, revelation comes. And he speaks to David and he said, this is where the temple will be built. It's Mount Moriah where Abraham offered up Isaac. It was revealed to him that the temple will be built on repentance. Solomon knew that pattern. David had taught him because his first role as king, he went to Mount Gibeon where Moses' tabernacle was. The ark was not there, but he placed a burnt offering at a brazen altar of repentance. And when he did, 
That's where you will study. He received his wisdom and his knowledge, his riches and his wealth and his honor. It was at an altar of repentance. Then he leaves there and he goes to Mount Zion where the tabernacle of David is, where the Ark of the Covenant is. And he prays again and the fire falls again. When you study this book, you will find every great revival started with repentance. My mother has whipped us so many times over 2 Corinthians Chronicles 7.14. And if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, if they will make an about face, let me tell you what we are good at at repentance. We are good as people of the name of going to the altar of repentance and we stop doing things. If I would preach on something right now and I would tell you, I know you men and women of God, that I think that's hindering your walk with God, you would stop it. But what we are not good at is when we go to the altar of repentance of start doing some things. We can stop, but we can't start. And what God is calling us to do in this conference. I've stood here 32 years and I know we leave here pumped up. And for six to eight weeks we have great revival. And then we start waning. God has, if he has spoken to me, there is something going to happen in this conference because of the repentance we're going to do today that we're not just going to stop doing things. We're going to start doing something. He said, curse you, Morose, not because you sin, but because you didn't do nothing from God. When we read Joel 2, 28, in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It's going to fall on you, Mike. He said he had poured on us. Remember three times he said, Pre- preacher, he said, weep between the porch and the altar. My pastor two weeks ago taught me what the porch and the altar was. He said, your porch is your daily walk with God. He said, but the altar is where you deal with your heart issues. We know how to deal with porch repentance. But is it possible that we can move to heart repentance? Could God do something in this conference that would bring us together as a body? That we can repent things we hold against somebody or things that happened years ago or things in your heart that needs to happen. Is it possible that God could take us from the porch to the altar and there would be a revival of repentance? 725 times. He talks about a pure heart. 725 times he talks about heart repentance. So I started a journey. And I started looking at myself. Because the first words of John was repentance. The first words of Jesus on ministry was repentance. The first words he spoke to his disciples was repentance. The first words he says to the seven churches our superintendent spoke from. The only church he didn't ask to was Philadelphia. And when I looked into where I was, and I knew where I was going, and I saw the holiness of God. I have never been where I'd been the first three weeks of January. I have never fasted like I fasted the first three weeks of January. I saw my unholiness. I felt like Joe felt when God just said, you're a pure man. And God just called him a perfect man. He looks up and he sees the holiness of God when God just called him perfect. And he said, I abhorred myself, which means I hated myself. When I saw what I was in the holiness of God, there was nothing about me that I liked about myself. Daniel said, he said, when I looked up and saw God, and I'm about done, he said there was no comeliness, which means... There was no beauty. I didn't care what people thought about me. I didn't care what people said about me. It didn't matter whether my tie or pocky hanky matched. It didn't matter what label I wore in my suit. All commonness left me. All desire to be beautiful. The only thing I desired 
was the fire from heaven to touch my lips and the holiness of God to rest upon me. That's why dad taught me. He said, Anthony, and he taught me to pray that tabernacle. Thank you for so many that's responded. But he said, Anthony, in our apostolic movement, we want big arcs, but we want little altars. He said, if you will study it, Anthony, you could put the ark inside of the altar at least five to seven times. The altar was so much bigger than the ark of the covenant. And we try to go to that ark of the covenant without having built big altars of repentance. Would it be something if we could repent? Would it be something that district superintendents, would it be something that every leader on this platform, would it be something if we went to our face tonight? Would it be something that even before I finish tonight, if some of you young people started crying out to God, wouldn't it be something if repentance swept over this congregation? I'm done with this. I'm done with this. I have no, first time I guess in the history that I, Terry will tell you, he's prayed for me, I think more for me than he has his arm. He said, Pastor, you got it? I said, I don't have a clothing. And so I worked at five o'clock, I don't have a clothing. I don't have a red bandana story to tell you. I don't have a young man that believed the red bandana story and was killed in a car wreck and his parents stood here before us. I don't have my daddy's voice to throw on the screen tonight to, shake and scare all of us to death. The only thing I can tell you is God has sent me as a leader here because of time to call this church to repentance. And tomorrow afternoon, we're going to take communion together. And in the middle of my fast, I had a pastoral meeting and everyone was gathered in there and we were crying and we were praying and I, I was bringing it to a close. And I said, in Jesus' name, amen. And I looked and the staff had their heads bowed you could hear a mouse breathing it was the presence of God so I said let me start praying again so I started praying again and I stopped and said gentlemen you can go and they stayed there and then there started a little rumble of prayer and all of a sudden I went into a prayer that I have not worked on yet but I am asking every minister God gives you your text but I'm asking every minister if God would lead you to your next communion service to preach on this subject because it hit me so strong and I haven't studied it out. Preparation for Passover. I got to thinking of that Old Testament. What they did to go to Passover and communion was coming up for the POA on Sunday. And I looked at what they had to go through, Jerry, they had to get that lamb. Some things it was four to ten days, however they had to shut it up. They had to make sure it was perfect. Then they had to get in their homes and they got their brooms out and they, they got their, of course, not vacuum cleaners, but let me, let me paint a picture. They got their vacuum cleans out. They got all their things. We got to wipe everything. What are you doing, baby? Kids looking, what are you doing, mama? It's Passover time and there can be no leaven when we go to the temple. And when we get there, that lamb that we have raised, you can't walk into the Holy of Holies. You don't have the opportunity to do that. You've got to take your lamb and you've got to pass it off to a priest. And then he will handle your sacrifice. Then he will take the fire off of the altar and he'll put it in one bucket. Then he will take the blood uh, of the, your animal on this end. And he will take that blood and he'll walk back and he'll go through every piece of furniture, the article of laver of water. The, he'll go through the, fire, the, veil, the, the outer court and he'll go to the inner court. And he'll go to the seven golden candlestick and he'll apply blood. Then he'll go to the table of showbread and he'll apply blood. And then he will go to the altar of incense and he will apply blood. And then somehow he gets through that veil and he puts that blood there. That's what you have to do. You have to clean everything out. I purposed it in my heart that the next time we have communion at P.O. Day, P.O.A., if I am alive, there will never be a week. I'm not going to ask them to do anything. I'm not going to ask them to pray unless we're on a fast. But I'm going to put it in their face the Sunday before the Sunday we take communion that you better start preparing your life. You better start preparing your home. You better clean everything up. If that Old Testament Jew went to that temple for Passover and for repentance, 
What should a New Testament man do that doesn't have to hand the lamb off because the lamb has already been slain? I can walk right in what Tim Pedigo wrote and what Tim Pedigo sang. I can go to the Holy of Holies myself. I can apply the blood myself. I don't have to have anyone do that for me because the lamb for sinners slain has done that for me. And that's why with Paul tonight, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them but dung for the excellency of Christ. And tonight I am through. I don't have anything. Lair, no music. I know you've got a song. No music. I call this church. We can't even get on our knees. We're so crowded. But you can sit right there and you're ready. You, you can leave when you feel like you need to leave. But if I have ever been led of God, I am calling this church to outright repentance. I, I, I have the anointing. I'm talking from our general superintendent to, to everyone on this platform. I am calling this church to a night of repentance that God can get us back to our purpose. Young people, PK, I'm calling you to repentance.
Lift your voices, ladies, lift your voice. Let the ladies of Zion travail. I hear some all across the congregation. Would all the ladies lift their voices right now? You know how to travail from childbirth. Would you lift your voice right now? Go ahead, ladies, lift your voice right now. Now somebody in this room is going to get a mantle. It's been confirmed. Men with the ladies, with a mantle-seeking spirit, would you cry out to God, men? Let God send a mantle from one of the ancient mantles of God fall upon us. Let the ancient mantles of God fall in this place right now. Let the mantles of just men made perfect just men made perfect fall on we men right now. Come on, PKs, there's something for you. I was at Youth Congress. I know something's on you, PKs. Go after it right now. Go after the mantle of the prophets. Come on, men of God, go after the mantle of the prophets.
Holiness of God. Let the glory cloud fill this place. Let us see your holiness. These men and women are repenting before you. Show us your glory, O oh Lord. Let us become like Moses that had to put a veil over his face. Hey, these men and women, may they walk to their pulpit Sunday morning. And may the glow and the fire of God be so strong on them that they will have to be veiled from the eyes of the people. That your power will manifest itself in such a strong way. Renew every preacher and wife that's in this room. We know there's many more sermons where you're going to touch us before Thursday night is closed. But oh God, would you at this time move in this congregation? And would you let our doubts turn to faith? Let our ears become sensitive to your spirit that we may hear what you're going to say all day long tomorrow and Thursday and Thursday night. I ask you through these men and women that have repented before you, I ask you, Lord, to lift the burdens of doubt and lift the burdens of entanglements back home and the frustrations that have had them bound that sometimes it's hard to even hear what the preacher is saying. May tonight, May tonight, oh God, you clear our minds. May tonight you give us a clear hearing of what thus saith the Lord for the next two days and two nights in this conference. Don't let the things of home get us down. Don't let the situations of this world bind us. But, oh God, in the next 48 hours, let us have fresh fire from heaven that will consume us before the lights are turned out Thursday night. Get a coal off of the altar right now. God, I have preached. These men and women have responded to your word. Now, God, I ask you to respond by taking a coal right now from the altars of heaven and touch every man and woman that's in this room tonight, oh God. Let there be a fresh anointing. Let there be fresh fire. Let there be fresh unction. Let there be fresh faith. Right now, I pray for fresh faith to be baptized in this congregation. I pray for fresh faith to come into this congregation. Oh, God. I pray for a new faith to hit our organization. I pray for faith to baptize us right now, oh, God. Baptize us with new faith. Baptize us with the I can do it spirit. Baptize us, God, that we can reach our cities. Baptize us with it can be done. Baptize us with faith. Baptize us with fresh vision. Not only, oh God, touch our hearing, but touch our eyesight, oh God. Let us go back to spiritual 2020 vision that we can see things in the spirit. Let us see things in the congregation. Let us see things that we can fix, oh God. Give the gifts of the spirit. Let the gift of the prophet and the apostles and the pastor and the teacher and the evangelist. Let the gift of tongues and interpretation and healing and faith. Let it operate, oh God, wisdom and knowledge. Let it fall in this congregation. Impart it to us. Take the coal of fire. Touch our lips afresh in them. Fresh, fresh fire. Burning lips. Burning lips. New anointing. Fresh fire. Give us a new vision of you. Give us a new vision. with faith. Baptize us with the gifts. Baptize us with the anointing. 
Let us become men and women of unction. Let it flow from our innermost being. When we walk to pulpits, let conviction fall. Let the sinner be convicted and let the saint be renewed. Let there be revival in every congregation. Right now, God, these men and women will leave Thursday and they'll be headed back to the same people. But as you spoke to Cornelius and spoke to Simon Peter miles away, you can move on their congregations back home right now. I pray right now that in their home churches, their saints are moved by the Spirit of God right now. And that you prepare their hearts to hear what thus saith the word of the Lord. Prepare our churches. Prepare our evangelists. Prepare everything, God. Get the way straight, oh God. As we've repented and given our heart to you, let fresh fire rest upon. I just feel one more unction right now if we'd release it in the spirit. Oh, Brother Urshan told us this. He lived with us for three months. He said, Anthony, put your hands on your innermost being and don't say a word. Just go, ah! Right now, I'm asking this congregation, put your hands on your innermost being and scream out an ah. Would you do that? <laughs> 